Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Engineering Dynamics. In this video, we will be talking about the Rayleigh-Ritz method on how to get the eigenfrequencies of a system, of a continuous system, where we propose a set of functions, which will be our eigenshapes, eigen, uh, and where we would like to find the uh, eigenfrequencies of that system with the given eigenshapes that we chose. So let's jump right in. The Rayleigh-Ritz method is basically a approximation. So we have a function in time and space and we propose a solution already. So we propose functions on how the system could look like. So for example, we have a beam and we say that beam is vibrating, for example, up and down. So we propose a function that looks like, well, it could vibrate like that, or it could vibrate like this one, or it could be something like that, or it could be something like this one. So these are all functions that we could propose. The most important part to understand is that we can't propose just any functions. We have to satisfy internal compatibility conditions so that we can derive this function and that the essential boundary conditions are met. So the essential boundary condition in this case are that the displacements at where we say that the system is fixed, our function also must be zero. So we can't propose just any random function. For example, if we have, this is our bar, we can propose a function like this because then it would imply that if we modulate this function up or down by some amplitude, we would say that the free point is not moving, but the fixed point is somehow moving up and down. So we can only propose functions that are zero where we have a fixed point. So for example, if this is our beam and we have two fixed points, we can only propose function that start at zero and end at zero. So something like this or something like that and so forth. So we need to understand that we propose functions from the beginning and these will be our eigenshapes basically. So the shapes that the system could take and we modulate them with our time function. And these two and these functions need to fulfill our boundary conditions. From that, we can say that our displacements, again, are our time functions and our amplitudes, so Q function of T. If we know, or because we know the differential equation of our solution, of our system, we propose, uh, we can, we need the derivative in, uh, in space, so dx. So our strain is basically, this is also now, strain is a function of time and space. So we derive our space function with x, and if we derive our space, uh, our time functions with x, we get nothing. So this is just a constant, and we will get the b matrix and the q, uh, uh, b vector and a q, where b is our strain interpolation matrix. So we know that b and q is equal to our strain, and we can now with the help of this equation and the boundary conditions. So this is, we can insert our u in here and in there, and we will get b times q, because this is basically the strain, and f times q double dot, because this is our u dot dot is equal to um, f times q, but f is only dependent on x, so we need to double derive our q's, our time function, and we get this one, and have the boundary condition at the end that where our force is. So if we look at our system, we propose a system like this. So we have here a force, and here we have a displacement. And this is now our discretized system. So if we solve now with the help of that, we will get the solution of our cues that we are interested in. But the problem is that this, after we inserted our values from here, this is the exact solution, but we inserted our approximation. So this is never 
not true. So this is probably never the actual solution of the system because we can't always guess the eigen shapes of our so, so the shapes of our function. So we want them to be zero. So we want our functions that we inserted being uh, ex the exact functions, but they are not because we have this and this is never the actual is not equal to q double dot exact. So we will have some residual forces that are in our constraints. So this is some residuals and we see those residuals as like reaction forces on our system that only fulfill that fulfill our equations that we proposed. So we're kind of adding like artificial constraints to our system. So if we have a continuous system and we propose functions and we tell the system, well, you can only move with these kind of functions, we're actually setting those constraints to our system. And these are the residual forces that are acting on our system because we're only giving it degrees of freedom that we proposed right here. So now we apply the virtual work principle because we know that if we have reaction forces and we want to get rid of those reaction forces, we just need to project our system into the direction where we can move. And the direction where we can move is well exactly the f direction, so the vector f that we proposed from the beginning. So we have a integral, so this is the first part and this is the second part. So these are coming from here. So, so this is the first equation and this is the second equation. So here we have a integral because we're going over the whole volume. And here we only have a from zero to L where we only look at the surface. So at the end of our bar, then we do the, we multiply that out and we get the virtual work principle again, where we are not interested in the dqs because in the virtual work principles, this is supposed to be true for any dq. So we are left with these two equations. And now we propose a integration by parts. Let me switch colors where we use this one plus this is equal to that, where we get multiple terms. We get this one, we get, let's choose green for, uh, this is, let's say we get this one and we get this one after we do integration by parts. So we see that what we are left with is we have the same thing, the same thing here and there. So these will cancel out and we have a new term that is the B times the strain, uh, sorry, the Young's modules times the area times BQ. So this will be right here. Then we have the all the things we had from before, before. So we had F times F is this part. And what we are left with on this side, let's choose some color we didn't use. We have F times N is this part right here. And the last thing we have is F transpose F transpose X. This is the part right here. So this is basically you just need to do this derivation once to understand how we get from our not exactly solved equations where we had the residual forces to multiplying pre multiplying them with the direction where we can move to get rid of those reaction forces and get this equation. And this equation can be put into a matrix form. So this equation is actually a matrix where we had this part, this part, and this part. And we already see, well, if this is a matrix and here we have some Qs, this is probably the stiffness matrix. And here we have some Q double dots, and this will be our mass matrix. So we have KQ times MQ, which is equal to, we say that this is a additional force G. So we have the mass matrix, the stiffness matrix, and the additional force G. So M by M is symmetric and positive. So positive definite, that means that all eigenvalues are positive and K is symmetric, uh, but possibly not positive. So depending on if we're having like uh, positive or negative 
or in quotation marks, negative stiffness, so unstable systems, we do not have a positive matrix. So to summarize again, we proposed some functions. We proposed functions, inserted them in our differential equations and saw that we have residual forces. We then applied the principle of virtual work with partial integration, where we got a new equation. And then we just transformed that equation into a matrix form and got the part that we already saw many, many times where we have the mass and stiffness matrix equal to some external force. Now, how can we interpret those weighted residuals? Because this is our function T, so the directions, and the residual in the volume and the residual over the space. So this is coming from here. So we have the residuals in the volume and the residuals on the surface. So the approximation of Rayleigh Ritz is minimizing the error. So we minimize the error in the equilibrium equations weighted by the shape functions. So we have the same the shape functions and we have some errors and we now try to minimize this error when we integrate with the shape functions so that in general our error is zero. So sometimes we're a bit over, sometimes we're a bit under, but in when we look at the whole system as a whole, we always see that, well, the residual is zero. So we do make mistakes, but we try to minimize them as much as possible. And what do we know from residual, uh, from reaction forces? So the reaction forces introduce somehow more stiffness into our system because we're, if we're giving more constraints to our system, it will have to use different shapes or more complex shapes to vibrate. And those vibrations will be at a higher eigenfrequency. So we have the approximate eigenvalues, C, so this is Rayleigh Ritz, and the exact eigenvalues that we got from the first video, some from the video before that. And we know that our Rayleigh Ritz approximation is always larger or equal to our exact eigenfrequencies. When are they equal to? Well, they're equal to if we say that we want to or that we use the exactly the analytical solution of our shape functions. Then we will get the same eigenfrequency. But in the end, we're only, if we apply a discretization, we're applying additional constraints and we make our uh, system stiffer. If we look at an example, so we have, again, this is our bar, clamped free, so right there. And now we can propose functions. For example, we have a set of function and we would like to choose one. Can we choose the one? So it will look something like this. Well, no, we can't because this one is not satisfying our essential boundary condition because it's supposed to be zero when X is one. But we can choose the second one and the third one. And this will be our function. Then we need to get the mass and stiffness matrix. So the mass matrix is just our mass times this one squared because this is m1 m1 then we do the same thing for m12 so we multiply let's get rid we multiply this and that so that's where we get cubed and cubed and for m22 we just have this one squared and we get this solution for the stiffness matrix let's look again at our at our function there it is the stiffness matrix work works with the derivative of our space functions. So that's why we need to derive it. And here we have a squared because we use the first one twice. Then we use the derivative of the first and the second, and then the derivative of the second and second, which is the second squared. And we will get a mass and stiffness matrix, so stiffness elements. And we know that K1, 2 is equal to K2, 1, and the same for the mass, where the mass 1, 2 is equal to mass to one. And we are left with this equation. And if we propose now, for example, Q is equal to some function, for example, uh, Q times cos omega T, and we derive it twice, we will get a Q double dot is equal to minus omega squared times Q. 
So inserting that into our equation, we will get this part. And now we just need, well, we're not interested in our Qs. Uh, this is the trivial solution where Q1 and Q2 is equal to zero. We're interested into our omega, uh, in our omegas. So this is our equation from the thing we had before. We eliminate that one and we only left with these two parts where we again say that k minus omega squared m, the determinant is equal to zero because that's how we eliminate the trivial solution. And we will get two equations. So these uh, two equations, two omega squares. And these are our two eigenfrequencies. So we have 2.49 and 32.18. If we would have applied the analytical solution, we would see that we got for omega squared 2.4 and for the second eigenfrequency, 22. So we see that our eigenfrequencies of the Rayleigh-Ritz method are always bigger than the ones that we get with the, this is the, from the, sorry, from the analytical solution. Now, if we would have applied more eigenfrequent, uh, more shape functions, so for example, if we added the third one, we would also improve, we would not only get more eigenfrequencies because we have three functions, but we also would improve the eigenfrequencies from the first and the second eigenfrequency. So if we use, let's say, we use three functions, functions, we will get fairly close to the first eigenfrequency. We will get almost close to the uh, second eigenfrequency, but we're the, again missing completely the third eigenfrequency. And we can doing that, keep doing that by adding more and more eigen uh, shapes to our system. So we're giving it more and more degrees of freedom where this, how the system could move and we will slowly approach the exact eigenfrequencies. I hope this video gave you a better understanding on how we work with the Rayleigh-Ritz method. To summarize, the most important part is that we propose a solution for our system and we insert that into our equations of motion, uh, in our differential equations, we will get some residual forces that makes our system stiffer and from that, we apply the principle of virtual work to get rid of those forces in our equations. And we will get mass and stiffness matrices. And then we do the whole thing that we did so many times where we get the eigenfrequencies and we see that the eigenfrequencies of our system are higher than the ones with the analytical solutions. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments down below. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll see you next time.